good afternoon, good evening <laughs> for all participants. I see we still have participants coming. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, we're here today uh, for one more uh, spectacular webinar at socialprotection.org. Uh, it's a very exciting topic. Uh, we have an hour and a half uh, and I hope you all be uh, having an amazing experience and discovering new things. Uh, thank you uh, for all the panelists and uh, for socialprotection.org social for organizing this event. Uh, I am Ana Machado. Uh, I work as a program policy officer for WFP, and I will be moderating the webinar today. Our topic, as you can see, and I believe you've had heard when you registered, is disaster risk financing and social protection. So you bring three very interesting country cases. And um, before starting, I will be introducing you to our panelists today and also provide some idea and background on how the, the, the on the dynamics of the, of the webinar and also uh, how it will be developing through the agenda. So Paula, if you can please go next. So yeah, I think we can also go next. <laughs> Thank you a lot. Uh, just to give you um, an important information, this uh, dynamics of the debate that we have today draws from one uh, event, uh, the Global Adaptive Social Protection event that was uh, organized by GIZ and the World Bank in Berlin a couple of weeks ago. Uh, that event was a closed session, uh, was not uh, broadcast, so uh, we are taking the opportunity here to bring up the same country cases. And the uh, idea is that the supporting agencies uh, organizing the event will be also disposing the cases. So uh, apart from WFP, this is a collaboration between uh, the World Bank, the UNCDF, the United Nations Capital Development Funds, uh, the Insure Resilience Global Partnership, and um, yeah, uh, basically and socialprotection.org. Um, we are very happy to be uh, having the three cases, uh, as I mentioned, Nicaragua, that we come first, uh, Fiji, just after Malawi, and at the end, last but not least, uh, the global, re uh, the issue resilience case that we'll be presenting uh, more specifically on the global shield against climate risk that is a recently launched initiative, also supporting disaster risk financing and social protection. If you can go next. So apart from me, your moderator today, Anna Machado, we have our speakers and if you go next, please. Thank you. Um, Eliseo Araus, who is a program associate at WFP Nicaragua. He is the country office focal point for sovereign insurance and has expertise in program design, has been an important, very important stakeholder in promoting uh, macro insurance in Nicaragua. And he will be presenting today uh, the WFP's expertise and uh, basically the country offers support with the government on promoting the initiative and promoting macro insurance, linking it up to social protection. Um, we also have Amit Kumar, who is a development economist working at UNCDF. Uh, he has a large experience implementing financial and digital solutions, and uh, more importantly, also developing market-based risk finance solutions. Uh, and he will be presenting the case of Fiji, uh, a very interesting on the linkages between, between macro, micro insurance and social protection. If you go next, we also have uh, Ms. Evie Calcutt uh, from the World Bank uh, that has extensive experience working with the Minister of Finances and also promoting disaster risk financing strategies in many countries. Uh, and more importantly, also on linking up these strategies, DRF strategies with social safety nets. Uh, Mr. Evi will be presenting the case of Malawi to us. And last but not least, Ms. Jennifer Phillips from the Issue Resilience Global Partnerships. She leads the Center of Excellence on Gender Smart Solutions. And she is she will be presenting the case for the global shift. The issue resilience is a very important stakeholder in the, in the sector in promoting DRF and has also been having an important role in the connection between disaster risk financing and 
uh, shock response and social protection, adaptive social protection. So if you just move to the next slide. Just a reminder to all of you, uh, we have a key and a box. All participants are invited to be sharing the, their questions uh, to panelists during the session, during the entire session. Some of the questions will be able to be answered along the session, but some of them will be selected to a short Q&A at the end. We have 15 minutes at the end for the Q&A. Uh, you can also be sending uh, messages on the chat. Uh, and this will allow us a bit more of interaction and dynamic on today's webinar. And uh, before I just move to our participants and I don't have much more time, but uh, basically I would like to just to have you, um, just to help you to localize what you're discussing today. So when discussing DRF, disaster risk financing, you're basically speaking and talking about pre-arranged financing mechanisms and instruments that can support countries to find the resources and allocate the necessary resources and grant them to shock response and social protection. Uh, we know that financing is one of the largest challenges for countries to actually implement the responses, uh, especially today in the case that um, most of the shocks and climatic shocks, they actually affect the low and middle income country. So uh, what you're discussing here, you're discussing about reserve funds, budget allocations, contingent credits, uh, insurance rest instruments. And today we'll be mostly talking about insurance. So this uh, financing instrument that we have at the top. Uh, both Nicaragua, Fiji and Malawi has been uh, important, interesting examples on linking uh, insurance instruments to social protection. And that's what we're gonna be looking at today. Uh, at the end, uh, we have the Jennifer, as I mentioned, speaking about the global shift and providing you with very important information on this recently launched uh, platform and financing, not financing instrument only, but also uh, an important initiative that will be mostly focused on the most vulnerable countries. And Jennifer will be having 10 minutes at the end to clarify us on what's going to be, what's, what is actually what they're talking about on the global shift. We have one more slide, um, if you go next, yes. That just summarized the potential benefits uh, for both sectors, DRF and social protection. Here, I just wanted to explain to you that we have mutual benefits for both sectors. Uh, it's important, that's, imp that's why you're discussing so much about these linkages. Uh, both because DRF can provide uh, social protection with some reliable and um, resources that I just mentioned that uh, can be really scarce, when, especially when discussing shocks and in crisis contexts. And also for DRF to count on mechanisms to actually be able to reach out the most vulnerable through social protection that's usually normally already there uh, in most countries, as we know, that in most countries you already have some sort of social protection instruments and a program supporting the, the populations. So apart from this benefit, we know we have many challenges that we're gonna be exploring today as well during this very little discussion. So if you want to know more and please go to the next slide. We have a recently launched publication uh, from WFP uh, with support from GAZ uh, and also review from many other partners on linking disaster risk financing and social protection. It just sums up to the large literature emerging on the topic. I invite you all to to know we also be providing the link apart from the QR codes. So all the concepts, definitions, rationale, you're gonna be finding there. So I'll just move to our first speaker, <laughs> Mr. Elise Warauz. And thank you a lot, everybody for be attending the webinar today. Over to you, Elise. <laughs> thank you, Anna. And welcome everyone for your participation in this amazing webinar. So I will start by sharing my, my screen now. And, okay. Let's start. Uh, first of all, I think it's important to understand that there are different financial management instruments or solutions. In particular, in this case, I will be presenting, uh, well, we, I will be focused on microinsurance solutions. Uh, but what is microinsurance is basically a financial service that is provided to a countries so that they can transfer a certain level of risk, loss, or damage to a, a third party. In this case, insurers such as CRIV, which is the Caribbean Catastrophe Risk Insurance Facility, 
uh, it's a risk pool for Caribbean and Central American countries provide this service to countries in exchange of a small fee that we also know as a premium to acquire uh, insurance policies. When something happens, when an event shocks, let's say tropical cyclones, earthquake, or the excess rainfall drop, this uh, insurance policy uh, might trigger and re because it reached certain level of pre-agreed uh, level of damage or losses. So the insurers provide a payout to a country to partially compensate the losses uh, and damages. Eliseo? Yeah? Uh, just a second. We cannot see your slides. So perhaps if you could just double check. Okay. Yeah. Display. Otherwise, we have the backup here. We can do that for you. Let's see. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. I think they are coming up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Just seeing yes. the your ah, now. Now it's working. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so here we have an overview of the WFP macro insurance uh, portfolio. Yeah, so currently the WFP promote different financial solutions. Uh, among those financial solutions, we have the macro insurance. And to put this in perspective, I would like to share uh, these three uh, models implemented by WFP in different countries uh, around the world. The first model is uh, widely known is uh, the R replica approach. And this model is also known as a more, uh, mirror policy model. And what it does is to duplicate the premium options provided by a government. So let's say that a specific government invests $1 million in premiums. So WFP matches these investments with another million uh, as well. So the government, if the policy triggers the government receive a payout to implement a specific response plans, but WFP in coordination as well with uh, institutions and, and national authorities also receive a payout to implement its own. Uh, the second model uh, it, it has been uh, tested in Dominica and Belize uh, is basically to partially increase the premium that is purchased by a government. Uh, when the policy is triggered, the government receives the full payment and the government is still the policy holder, implements all the activities by itself. And in this case, in this case the WFP approach is just a, as an enabling role to improve the policy options. And the third model is the one that has been applied to Nicaragua. It's very similar to the previous model one. Uh, but suppose that the WFP increased the government premium by 10%. So if an event uh, occurs that triggers the policy, uh, let's say a tropical cyclone or earthquake, so the government received a full payment. However, because WFP have an agreement between government and WFP, uh, the WFP receives 10% of the value of that, that payout to implement coordinated and complementary response plans with those of the government. And here, I, I just want to share with you the illustration of, of some of the process that goes uh, from the payment of premiums uh, to the top of, with the top of the RFP, uh, to the use of the fund, uh, the payout and use of the fund for different social protection uh, institutions. Um, okay, we know that uh, the effects of climate shocks can be prolonged and that the response provided by a government can be different depending on the severity of the events and the context, a specific context of each country. So it is not only about the immediate response, like this is something that I wanted to highlight, but it's also about what can we do in the uh, recovery phase and the development first to build back better and be better prepared for future events. So I should uh, this illustration we use so you can see some of the actions that can be carried out in coordination with the institutions. Each of these actions depends on national priorities and can be readjusted depending on the events and their effects 
on vulnerable population or vital infrastructure. Here, the case of, of Nicaragua. Last year, a WFP uh, of May 22 provide or enable uh, the government with a top up of 70,000 uh, US dollars. Uh, so WFP provide this top up to the government and the government pay the policy to the, to the CRIF. Uh, with the potential of WFP to receive up to $2.1 million in case of a catastrophic event. So uh, in October 22, uh, Hurricane Julia, it was a category one tropical cyclone, uh, made low landfall in Nicaragua, affecting almost 4 uh, million people, directly and indirectly. And almost 60% of the territory was affected by the, the effects of the, the hurricane. But also, uh, the, our GDP was affected directly uh, as well for the uh, partially or totally losses uh, on the infrastructure uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the government. So triggered by the level of the damage, uh, the CRIB, the insurance company, is boosted a, uh, a point my, a point nine million dollars payout to Nicaragua. So from this payout, WFP was uh, entitled to receive six hundred forty thousand, which is proportional to our top up. At that moment, our top up contribution uh, was around seven percent, and it was very specific for tropical uh, cyclones. So. Um, Okay, we were we we use we use these uh, specific funds to complement a more wide response uh, with complement com, com, complementing the emergency immediate re, uh, response and implementing early recovery livelihoods resilience and uh, environmental programs. So here some of the example of some of these activities. Okay, so the the crisp or the payout that we receive from the government that is from CRIM, were used along with other contributions to finance the whole hurricane Julia response operation. So the result of these activities are not specific to CRIM, but have contributed to expand our operation to achieve some of the following results. So at first, you, you can see here that we were able to increase a, the school meal with a, a, additional take home rations uh, and food during 60 days for more than 140,000 uh, uh, children in 12 municipalities. We were able also to expand um, and improve uh, school gardens, um, improving the food security of the students in more than 600 rural and urban schools of the uh, impact in the impacted areas. And, we also provide a productive support. We pilot a cash-based transfer modality for the first time. And here we support families whose livelihoods were more severely affected by the localized effects of the hurricane, the scale with flooding. And we uh, receive funds from the amount that we received in 2022, we kept uh, around 70,000 uh, US dollars uh, to provision for the renew of the policy uh, in this year. And for this year, this is the top up. Yeah, this year, Nicaragua government is contracted the tropical cyclone and earthquake policies. And then for the first part, for, for the first time, the WFP participate in the multidisciplinary technical working group. So we were able to contribute the, the selection of the policy options, the uh, participate in the deliberation of the most appropriate parameters for the Nicaragua context. And uh, this year, thanks to the WFP provisioning of the 70,000 uh, US dollar, um, uh, it was possible to renew the tropical cyclone policy, but also thanks to the global risk financial facility contribution, it was also possible to expand the top up uh, to of the tropical, so tro tropical cyclone policy and also expand to another policy with earthquake. So in total, this year we are contributing uh, almost 200, um, 
210,000 US dollars uh, to the policy, which is approximately 9% uh, for both policy. And you, you might see also here the WFP coverage. This is what we may be able to receive if an event or high intensity uh, or catastrophic uh, losses or damages happens. But there's always lesson learned, and so this is something that I want to I, that I want to also highlight for you that there is no one size fits all formula. Yeah, so it means that uh, the model that we are applying to Nicaragua might be different in other contexts, and it will depend of each of you and the relation that you 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 have with the, your government, also the national priorities as well. Uh, let them. Uh, it's important to have a layering approach. Means that. It's not just about macro insurance. Anna mentioned before, we have another solutions that we, we want to also explore a, a credit line, contingency funds, a cat bonds, for example, a, that might also help to support this also initiative. And also a, a, to address some lower le a level of risk, for example, with macro insurance or saving growth. And then uh, insurance is not the solution for climate change. It's, this is something that you, you need to, to know as well, that insurance is just a piece of all this puzzle. Yeah, but it's really relevant to, to address some of the effect of this climate change. And it's important in any case to create gen evidence generation. Uh, and here we have some of the main stakeholders that are involved in this process. I think it's important to to keep in mind that for, I mean, I try to put the three more important maybe lessons from each of the, those stakeholders to keep in mind. And for the insurance companies, it's important to keep premiums and process as low and as simple as possible. And also a responsive to members needs because we know that members have different needs. For example, the, this year we are expecting to be affected by uh, the, the phenomena of the Nino, of a high drop. So it's important to create this kind of products that also and services that government might be also to access. And uh, keep upgrading the product all the time. At the national level uh, with the uh, government, I might say that build national, continue building capacities. It's important to create contingency funds, uh, reserve funds, so every year have a, government have the, the possibility to, to contract this kind of policies. Uh, the multidisciplinary, the multidisciplinary task force is also important, and disaster risk management strategies because this will help you also to to be more effective in, at the moment of the, your implementation uh, through the different uh, social protection uh, uh, programs. At WFP level, I want to also to include some uh, other additional lessons. It's important to have donor support, of course is uh, really relevant to mainstreaming this kind of initiative into other WFP initiatives. And uh, keep, uh, have, for example, continue having uh, this kind of agreement, pre-agreed implementation plans with different institutions. So this is all for now. Thank you for uh, your time. Over to you, Anna. Thank you, Eliseo, for displaying the experience from Nicaragua and showing how much we have to learn with um, this country that's, I mean, might be, seems to be tiny in terms of geography and population, but has so much learnings. And uh, I know that WFP has been working really closely with the government to push these initiatives and uh, not only in the Nicaragua, but also in the region as well. So, Thank you a lot. I see a lot of learning opportunities and also the potentiality of expansion of the same experiences for tropical cyclones to other types of, uh, of risks, as you just mentioned, for droughts. So I see many interesting questions on the chat already that are potential learning uh, that you can take a look. But uh, we go back to them at the end as well uh, now, uh, just to continue our little discussions without uh, taking our time, <laughs> much of our time. Uh, let's go to Fiji's experience with Amit. Over to you, Amit. Thank you.
So, Hayana, can you confirm if you can uh, hear me well and see the screen? Yes. Yes, we can hear you all in clear and see the screen. Thank you. Okay. All right. So I'll move this away. All right. Well, first of all, thank you so much uh, for I mean, a really organizing this session. And as you mentioned, it is it is a follow up session where we are, you know, uh, getting into more details uh, as opposed to uh, uh, at, at the uh, annual forum. And I would also like to take this opportunity also to thank um, uh, uh, the scheme implementers uh, in, in Fiji, who because of, uh, you know, really primarily because of the time zone difference, it's post midnight there. So it would not have been very appropriate uh, for them to, um, to be joining at this stage. But I'm here to briefly talk about the, the Fiji case. Um, so a bit of an introduction, like UNCDF is one of UN less known agencies. Uh, it's one of those boutique, uh, what we call technical agencies in the UN system, and it has a capital mandate. What does that mean is uh, the, we have uh, some financing instruments that are that have been designed to connect uh, development finance to uh, local level. By local level, I mean that it includes to program like social welfare participants or programs can connect financing directly to individuals, to the to, to civil society, to the local private sector, to public sector, to governments. There are a range of instruments. And um, within UNCDF, uh, we have a program on climate risk finance and insurance uh, that works in several countries, uh, uh, including in the South Pacific. Within there, we have a specific program on where we have connected climate risk insurance mechanic mechanisms directly to the social welfare participants. And that's the case study. I will try to explain some of the details. Um, we have limited time, so I will try to give you one or two quick points. So I think it's important to know when we're talking about case of Fiji, it's a country, of course, you know, Pacific Islands are quite vulnerable to many um, extreme uh, climate events. And more than that, it's also the country where, you know, there is just the, the, the level of, say, local market development, local mechanics around uh, risk management, risk financing that are not yet super developed. But government has been uh, running several programs. So when we started two and a half years ago, there was the concept of uh, parametric uh, or climate risk insurance or parametric or index insurance was very new. There was, there is, we started with a zero baseline. So that meant like really building basic understanding of what it is and why this is useful and how this can be <laughs> applied and relevant. So there was a lot of uh, that type of uh, understanding building activities. But uh, after, you know, like a year, year and a half, year, one year of a lot of legwork, uh, the program uh, supported the launch of the first what we call market based uh, it's set of market based climate risk parametric micro insurance products uh, market based means that the instruments under the programs are delivered through the local market or local uh, private sector mechanics uh, mm, nearly all of the solutions under the programs are so called market driven which means they are not subsidized people who access them, they see value in it and they pay for it. And there is a private sector, there is, there is a whole ecosystem of players, payments provider, digital service providers, uh, education provider, and their business models have been linked in a way that they can offer these services. But then just like any other country, there are ought to be a certain segment of the population, the bottom so-called 10%, 20%, 25%, who are who do not have the mostly the economic means to deal with themselves so they they are part of the national social protection or national social welfare framework and for that there is a special program where we link the climate risk insurance program to the national social protection program in fiji um, i'll talk a little bit more of detail what it is so this is a bit of a context 
uh, the, the history of from where this type of idea and the product came about. In 2020, there was a cyclone, Harold, which, uh, which caused quite some damage in Fiji. The estimates were about 22,000 families were affected. And then after you know, much of deliberation and planning and resource mobilization, the Fiji government, the Fijian government uh, identified 10,882 part uh, participants who were part of the social welfare program that they would be provided some cash assistance uh, to help with the recovery and rebuilding efforts. And uh, what they did then did was they packed the assistance equivalent to an averaged out monthly otherwise paid social transfer payments there are different, there are six different schemes in Fiji, but four are predominant that covers 95% of the group of 87,000. So that figure comes around about a hundred Fijian dollar per month. Then government decided to make uh, it 200 Fijian dollar, which was great. It was a good help, but the process of assessments, losses, finding, finding um, financing for it, it took time nearly took four months. Uh, actually, the first payment went out after four months. So that's a long time. So that is when this whole thing came about, connecting the local insurers and the market systems in a way that payments can be made to the affected communities in a much quicker and a faster way, and where governments don't have to go for resource mobilization mode. While the damage is large, the government still have to make a response but uh, can we find some way, or you know, we, we were discussing with government or other partners, this, this development challenge, how might we make some amount of cash available to the affected communities under the social protection program relatively quickly, as quick as possible, certainly not four months. So then th this kind of gave birth to this idea of linking Climate, designing a climate risk insur or a climate risk insurance product linked to the social protection product, uh, policy that would cover up to otherwise four months of payment. So Fijian dollar 400 and which the money, if there is a trigger event, it would be made available directly to the participants. So as a concept, but we had to, we had to validate the concept and you know, not run a pilot and that's where UNCDF, WFP supported the Fijian government in uh, running a pilot with just 274 recipients um, to test that everything works, connections work, data transfers, policy issuance, all of that, payments run, all of this was done. After the successful pilot, the formal launch, as in the expanded launch started. So now this explain the conceptual block of the product or the solution. So one is, you see on the left is what in the parlance of um, insurance or a climate parametric insurance, we call this micro or macro. Macro is, uh, you know, what we just heard in Nicaragua. It's when typically the government or the sovereign level, uh, um, a product is taken and the sovereign state will receive the money and then they will route that money through various uh, channels that they would have. Micro on the other side is when say I as an individual or I as a small business or I as a farmer would have access to a policy. So what we did is we combined these approaches of for the social protection program because one of the objective was direct benefit to people. So what this product does is where Fijian government takes the policy as a master policy holder, but individual participants or the beneficiary of the social protection program, are it is the po policies are directly connected to them. So in the case of, so they have a claim. So the, when the, when the, when, um, and that comes to the second point, access to cash. So if there is a payout or a trigger event based on preset agreements, money is, money is paid directly from the private sector to the, uh, to the recipient into their uh, designated uh, wallet or a, or a bank account. In the current program, about 70, 72% of the people, we encourage them to have mobile wallet account. It's more efficient. They can access money a lot quicker. And then um, the idea is once the event data is vetted, between three to five days, money shows up in the recipient's account. 
And of course, it, it's combined with a lot of literacy, not just about insurance, but also about you know how they can better protect themselves uh, and how, of course, how judicially to use this money. And there are there is a whole component of literacy and education. Of course, we are talking about governments and countries with small fiscal budget, with small fiscal space. So affordability is an important point. So the lot of thoughts went into figuring out of ways of uh, keeping the premiums low. So currently, it's around about 14.5 US dollar or 13.1 euro per year. That's that what it costs to cover one beneficiary for them to have protection, financial protection up to what otherwise they will get for four months of payments, so about 400. And then the last point in the conceptual block of the design was, and which is also UNCDF's philosophy is, we want to build more sustainability and drive local market systems. So this product is underwritten by a local insurer, consortium of all the local insurers. Um, what this does is that over time we are building so-called insurance financial capacities locally. So it's not not all the risk or the all not all the risk is transferred out to reinsurance market, primarily sitting in Europe. So what this allows is over a period of time, the risk pool will locally be built and gradually the local market will keep taking higher and higher risk. And it not only assists the social protection system, but it builds a better culture around uh, climate risk insurance in the country. So to deliver that type of a mechanics, we, num we, we adopted what we call an ecosystem approach. So number of uh, players, were brought together or their, their, their own acts were put together. So you have local insurers where the, the, the Ministry of and Department of Social Welfare acts as the, the master aggregator. There are partnerships uh, with the, the Consumer Council uh, for some advocacy and, um, and literacy organizations. There's a lot of information that goes in terms of making sure the right person, they have the right information. We're talking about making payment directly to people who are in the social protection system. So we are talking about people like who are really old age people, for example, people, persons with disabilities. So financial and digital literacies are limited. So you need these partners to make sure, you know, that the, the whole responsible payment side of it. And then when the payout happens, the payout directly goes into the wallet. And then there are other ecosystem players who provide a certain role. There is insure tech involved. All this is done digitally. So the people don't have to go anywhere for registration. They don't have to go anywhere to get, uh, they don't have to file a claim. They just get the money directly into their account. Uh, so this is what the Fiji government is, this is how the government is looking to scale it. Currently the registered social registry has 87,000 uh, um, recipient included. Government is so-called cleaning up or uh, optimizing the registry. It will take more time, but that's the roadmap that how government sees. This is primarily done because um, there is limited financial uh, fiscal space uh, within, within the government budgets. So they want to do it gradually in a way that it is, it is more practical for them to do. Uh, after the pilot, which is initial in 2021, 2021, 2021, 22 cyclone season. That was the only time when the premiums were subsidized through development partners. But after that, it is all by the government there or through their own uh, national budgets. Now, Anna had asked me to talk about some of the challenges and, and what did we really learn about. But there are a few points which I and, and you know, my entire team thinks are really like we really learned there was a lot of things. How do you do a proof of concept? We cannot manufacture an event. We don't want to manufacture an event. So building a lot of that happened. So let, let's look at some of the challenges. One was this, this is very obvious, but it was, it has been quite a challenge, you know, like the Department of Social Welfare has never dealt with the market systems. Market players work on up-to-date data, much more consistent data, especially when it comes to the payment side. 
some of the registry is not always fully updated. People don't have their contact details, the phone numbers. We're talking about mobile wallets. So that, that it's really important what phone number they have and people buy SIM, throw SIM. So a lot of alignment and then connecting the data from the Met Office with the social registry and with the, with the insurance system. That's quite some work so that we perhaps did not, we underestimated the effort around that. Most of it is now streamlined, but that was something uh, to deploy a program of a macro to micro. This, whosoever is looking to do it, even ourselves, we are looking to do it in few other countries. We will be allocating a lot more time and energy to deal with this challenge. Second one, which also sounds very obvious, but it's, also, it's, it's, it's really, really important. We are really talking about people who are already vulnerable whether economically or physically, or, or they also tend to be relatively less educated. General awareness, general participation in economic processes is not there. In case of Fiji, many of these people tend to live in the Western division. So they are more living in climate kind of prone, disaster prone areas. So a lot of effort needs to be put into this area because people need to know that they have a claim. It is not just a handout, somebody showing up with, with an envelope of four or $500. It is their legitimate claim and they have the awareness of knowing about it, the benefits of it, getting the money, using the money, and more importantly, slowly start to become part of the, be included in the economic processes. Then the third area, which is a little bit related to the first area, uh, again, as mentioned for the department, this was a complete new thing. So this some effort needs to be put into strengthening local institutional capacities. Just for an example, say, in which format would the Department of Social Welfare, what do they need to vet before making out the payment? There are no, there were no current systems. They were used to do these voucher payments. So it's a different, complete different way of looking at it. So that needs to be dealt with. And then also we, you know, you want to make payments after that. You also don't want to spend two months in vetting the data. That that defeats the, the purpose of making cash available quickly. So that needs to be dealt with. That means internal institutional capacity needs to be dealt with. In many government, at least in the Pacific, many of these departments have two, three people and they have all sorts of things. So that that's something also we we knew it, but this is something to really, really care about. And it becomes even more important, not all countries, like Fiji has a fairly established and you know, has a good experience around social protection frameworks. There are regulations and other, there is quite, quite a lot of stuff. But in many other countries, so UNCDA works in, in primarily, you know, least developing countries and, and small island states, Many of those countries do not have established uh, social protection frameworks. Some don't even have specialized ministries or, or departments. The whole thing might sit under a broader ministry. So how do you work with the work in such countries? So you may need to become more innovative if you are looking to do this macro to micro. Last one is, is very important. It's around expectations as well as uh, sustainability. This whole scheme complements everything else. It does not replace this. Insurance, is the insurance payouts are there to help. They complement other things. They do not, there is no way anyone can really judge what is the loss. But the idea is to make cash available to affected communities quickly. But to really have long-term sustainability, not just for the scheme itself, which of course about how much it costs, what is the premium and all of that is, is market systems, but to make sure that people have the protection they need. These are the people who depends on the state. State has obligation to support them. So this needs to be seen through, uh, need to be done through complementary support programs. I think you know um, um, before we also heard things like uh, availability of contingency funds, especially investing in anticipatory action that can hugely help. As I gave example, like in this, in case of Fiji government start really um, uh, together with us, we started really um, educating people to see if 
if how they can reduce their vulnerabilities. You know, so all, all of that needs to happen. So many of these points sounds very uh, obvious, but from the whole design and implementation and now in the scale program, these are the four areas to be really taken care of, and these are the four challenges now we are looking to work we are working on them and you know trying to sort of fine tune the program so that when it is reaching gradually to the entire 100% social registry it has minimum frictions or small we minimize the the small small issues that that comes up due to day to day implementation yeah so that's all our program is expanding from the few countries in the pacific uh, in from this year onward uh, we have a new vision which we call resilience over dependence so the program within uncdf covers various aspects social protection or adaptive social protection is one part but there is also market mechanics there are also miso solutions so we are expanding to do with the idea that we need to build resilience in, in, in vulnerable countries so that the, the aspect of dependence reduces. With that, I think I'm up with 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amit. It was really clear and uh, very concise with a lot of content presentation. Uh, we have so many questions at the Q and A chat. <laughs> I'm seeing 19, so I don't know if that's a good sign or a bad sign. Yeah, thank you. This is very good. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, for the panelists that have a bit of time, a long presentations, if you can just go back to the chat and also try to start responding, then uh, yeah, I will be selecting some. But again, like you already have 20 questions. That's very good interaction. Uh, Evie. Over to you uh, on the case of Malawi. And uh, yeah, good questions already came on the relation to DRF and drops. And I believe the what Evie will bring to us today will be also very important to elucidate this. Over to Thanks. you. Thanks, Anna. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Evie Calcutt, and I'm a financial sector specialist at the World Bank. Um, and I've been part of the um, the project team at the World Bank that's been helping the government of Malawi implement their social support for resilient livelihoods projects. Um, and actually, it's a, a public holiday in, in Malawi today. Otherwise, uh, we would have, of course, had someone from government uh, joining me on this presentation, but, uh, but I'm presenting on their behalf, uh, which I'm very happy to do so. Um, my presentation is quite dense, but I'm going to kind of signpost you really to a lot of the different materials that we that we have. Um, and I'm going to start with an overview of what I'm going to tell you um, and, and then hopefully um, go through each part in, in detail. But the, the headline is that the government of Malawi have put in place a scalability mechanism to um, help them respond to shocks and in particular drought shocks uh, through their social cash transfer program. So not reinventing the wheel, using the systems that are there, but putting financing and uh, in particular a, a pre-finance plan behind it. Um, and this comes off the back of, you know, the government being really um, in a position of wanting to have a, a kind of a strategic vision for managing uh, these types of risks and, and putting in place a, a strategy to do that and receiving some additional support from trust funds, the Global Shield Financing Facility, formerly the GRIF, which enabled them to, to put things in place that they might not have had the, the expertise and confidence to do so, but have been able to invest. Um, in terms of impacts, uh, the mechanism is now covering around 600,000 people in six districts of Malawi. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about how those were selected, um, but they use rainfall data, food and security data to um, deliver the, um, the response when it's needed. So to use that to, to trigger the response. Um, the financing plan is a mixture of risk, risk retention and risk transfer. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how they've managed that and some of the challenges in putting those different instruments um, in place. Uh, and then the experience to date. So they've actually um, had this mechanism in place for the last two seasons. So 21-22, 22-23. Um, and they've made some payouts uh, over that period. Um, fewer payouts this year because the, 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 the drought conditions uh, weren't there, um, but last year they were, and so there were significant payouts last year. And then I'll wrap up with a bit about the lessons as well. Um, global audience today, so, so, so some of you may not be familiar with Malawi, but it's a country in kind of East Southern Africa um, and very acutely prone to disasters, including floods, droughts and storms. 
and um, this contributes to persistent and very high levels of poverty. So those two maps on the right hand side there, they show kind of levels of poverty as a, as a percentage and they show kind of vulnerability to disasters. So you can see, you know, the darker colours uh, significantly overlapping in the south of the country, but also in central. And then you get more localised um, uh, relationships as well. Um, you know, there's 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 significant uh, impacts on on the economy and liquidity challenges that the government has to face, and um, in in light of those. So this is where that 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 view for taking a more proactive role from government comes from. Um, just put a few figures on the slides, but the pretty large large figures there. You know, in 2016, uh, there was an El Nino uh, enforced drought um, had huge implications on on lives and livelihoods with 50 percent uh, of the population at risk of severe food insecurity so huge amounts of people affected and we're going into a, most likely an el nino period so so government have got a very close eye on this and huge concerns that that could um could happen again uh, but they have some systems in place so, so there is a good news story there uh, and the faster we can reach people um uh, the faster we can uh, protect them as well um, so just to give you a bit of context on the DRF side, so less so on the specifics of social protection side, but in terms of the DRF side, um, it's a very, you know, in terms of the kind of the status quo, it's been a very reactive response to, to disasters in the past. There were these budget reallocations and uh, there was a vote of unforeseen expenditures trying to get money uh, for these kind of contingent events. But that was quite slow and challenging to, to actually find uh, budgets within a limited uh, fiscal space. Um, there's a huge support from a, a development partner network and humanitarian network in Malawi, um, but, but it's quite fragmented and, and there's a hope to bring that together. Uh, when I started working in Malawi four years ago, there was very limited pre-arranged funds. Um, so the government wanted to be more proactive um, and they wanted to use the channels that they have to reach poor people. The, the poor and vulnerable households in times of crisis because they had this this national safety net system um, and they wanted to be able to do make that work harder and, and go further. I'm just going to give you a quick kind of glimpse uh, at the strategy that the government put in place because this is really the anchor for everything that they've done on social protection in terms of the kind of uh, adaptive aspects of it. So. The government worked with the bank and with other partners to to develop their disastrous financing strategy uh, from 2018 to 2023. Um, so it's been in place for a few years now, lots of lessons there. And, and the mission was to uh, proactively manage economic and fiscal risks, as well as protect the public finances against disasters. Um, and so within this, it was really led by the Ministry of Finance. Um, but they brought in a, a team from a number of different line ministries and, and, and different departments within the Ministry of Finance as well. So you pulled in the experts on social protection, pulled in the budget division, pulled in the Ministry of Agriculture. You know, all the different areas came together to develop this strategy. And um, they had kind of six strategic priorities that they wanted to strengthen. But, but just for, for, the, for the purpose of, of this session today, the, the key one was to identify areas where they could actually better understand the fiscal risks and the impact channels of those risks on, on, on the budget uh, and put in place a portfolio of, of disastrous financing instruments. So which instruments were right for them? Which ones did they have the funding for? Where might, be they, where might they be able to get additional support externally to enable them to build up a risk layered approach? And this um, visual on the slide just gives you a sense of what they were thinking and the, some of the instruments that they've had. So they were taking this um, risk layering approach and they were saying, right, we need some contingency funds, budget reallocation for things that are, are kind of more high frequency types of, of expenditures, but less severity. So smaller pots of money. And they, they wanted to put in place a disaster risk management fund which they have now established, but is yet to be capitalized. Um, they wanted some contingent credit. So they had a World Bank uh, catastrophe drawdown option, which was put in place 2019 and actually closed 2022, dispersing uh, fully uh, the 70 million for tropical cyclone Idai and, and COVID. Um, but the other kind of key strategic pillar was actually thinking about how they could make their social protection systems more adaptive and how that linked with different types of risk financing um, instruments. So I'll talk a little bit about that now, but hopefully that just gives you a sense of where this has all come from within the government's uh, kind of priorities. 
so just a little bit on the status quo of um, of uh, kind of shock responsive social protection in Malawi, because they were doing shock responsive social protection before this program came about, um, but they wanted to change slightly how they were doing it. So historically, and, and still today as well, to some extent, but the, the government responds to food and security crisis through lean season response. So if you look at that, that, that uh, timeline uh, that I've got on the slide, um, it's, a, it's a little bit heavy, but if you go down the bottom and you look at the se lean season box in, in red at the bottom, kind of covering November to, to, to March, in bad years where there's a drought or there's other things that affect food insecurity, that lean season grows. So you get it starting much earlier and extending uh, beyond at the back as well. So you need to be able to get additional finance and ideally you need to be able to get it out much quicker. But what's been happening is once there is um, uh, kind of agricultural season ends, you have your, your main harvest, the government will start their vulnerability assessment period, that will run for a few months. Um, and then it's a case of at that point, generating the, the kind of financial request and bringing the funding together alongside partners to deliver the, the response in the lean season. And that could be around January, February in a year. But actually, in a bad year, that extended lean season can start as early as July and August. Um, and so what the government really wanted to do was see if there was a way to, to get funding out more quickly before the lean season commences, because that's when people are making their risk management decisions, you know, <laughs> deciding whether to send children to school, um, selling their assets and things like that. It's also when the price of food is, is more affordable. So better for people to have funding then than later. So um, what came out of all of these discussions? Well, the, um, the government worked with the World Bank to put in place this, this project, the Social Support for Resilient Livelihoods project. And, and the aim of this is to uh, improve the resilience among the poor and vulnerable populations and really strengthen the platform that government has in Malawi for safety nets. So it's got kind of key three programs, on th sorry, three key programs under it. Social cash transfer program, a public works program and a livelihoods program. And, um, and what the government wants to do is actually integrate into that this financing scalable safety nets or shock responsive social protection. There's also elements on uh, improving the delivery systems and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later, as well as capacity building and, and there's, some, there's some contingency in there as well for, for other events as they happen. So now I'll talk a little bit about the mechanism because it's in place and it's designed and the government are, are implementing it. So let me tell you where it's come from. And uh, before you get too worried, there's lots of information that I can share uh, that's already published to, to give you the details as well, if you're interested. So essentially what the government were trying to do was to have an early action, pre-agreed transparent trigger. So there was no discussion about whether they were scaling up or not. Um, or at least the discussion was very structured um, with pre-positioned financing around it linked to those triggers to be able to make um, th th those decisions very quickly. So they did, they started off by, by doing a review of the available drought data sources in Malawi. So things like satellite data, ground weather data, the Met Department were very involved, um, data on food insecurity at the kind of global level as well as at the country level. Um, crop yield data, things like that. So there was a, a big melting pot of all this information. And then they th wanted to think about, well, how do we use this information in, a, in an index to inform what we're doing? And, and there was a lot of kind of technical work done to the pros and cons, but essentially what they got out of it was a framework for triggering a scale up um, using primarily rainfall data. So what I've just shown on the slide there, this is the, the a very simple version of the triggering mechanism. But if you remember, the, the season runs from November to um, uh, kind of April, May in, 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 uh, in Malawi, early April, really. And so what they are doing is they're monitoring the rainy season from, from November to April. And they've decided to have two rainfall trigger points, one between February uh, and March and one between April and May. And they're using satellite data there to monitor rainfall patterns. So they're monitoring the early season which is really, really, really highly correlated with future lean season. So a poor early season, uh, a poor lean season. And they're also looking at the whole season as well, just in case the rains are delayed or there's information collected, but most of the weight of their index is put on, on that early season. Now to, to back that up, the E that's shown there between May and June is an evidence review. 
So they bring these two triggers together. So if those triggers are met, uh, the early season or the full season, they scale up. But if they're not met, they also do an assessment just to check whether something was missed. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about an example where that was the case. And it brings in a, a fail safe. So they use other information around food insecurity, and et cetera. Um, and this is just this graph just shows you how they how they modeled those triggers. So you've got the, the early season in in, in, in yellow and then there's and the secondary, uh, which is the full season here in blue. Um, and then the, the dotted lines, those horizontal lines are the trigger points. Um, so they they were able to look at the years when historically they would have wanted to trigger and actually say, right, this is where we're going to set our threshold. This is the type of event um, that we want to want to make a payout for. And by doing that, they can start to estimate what this is going to cost. And that's fundamental for actually deciding on how to set up a financing plan. Um, the operational handbook that the government had developed around this sets out the triggers in detail and all of the rules of the of the of the mechanism itself. So that's published on the government's website. And essentially, this is the the, the kind of process that they follow and the data that they use and the information. So, so that so that's their their guide their guiding kind of um, rules book. And I'll just give you a few kind of key takeaways from from that. What what they're trying to to do in these six districts that they're covering is have some additional payouts for existing cash transfer beneficiaries so they're really the poorest in society um, and then have some some also available for those who are not currently beneficiaries but just outside that group so what we call horizontal um, coverage as well and they're they're providing an additional coverage of of 70 17 percent of households in these districts so you've got those district six, sorry there's six districts there and they were selected based on, on lots of different criteria, um, vulnerability to drought, food insecurity, but also having the systems in place to be ready to actually deliver this. You, know, you can have a great financing plan, you can have a great trigger mechanism, but if you can't get the money out to households, um, then it, it kind of falls apart. So, so they, just, they prioritize the districts that had the, the systems in place. And the idea is that those households will get you know, around $25 or so for three months um, uh, as soon as these these triggers are made. And what else is really great about this handbook is it sets out the kind of operational timeline. So who needs to do what when? Because even though the, the triggers are set, there's still quite a lot to be done um, once they are met. So there is a coordinator in government um, who, who leads on this and he collects all the information over the season and he prepares a scalability report. This report is then validated by a task force from multiple uh, ministries, including the Ministry of Finance. Um, and then it goes to the, the, the Secretary of Treasury and is authorised. Um, and then you work with the communities uh, to inform them this money is coming and deliver the funds. And in, in most of these districts, the funds is delivered through uh, financial institutions, um, but in a couple of them, it's still through, through cash. I'll talk quickly about the financing plan. I think I've got about five minutes left. Um, which should be perfect. So, as I said, by modelling those triggers, the government were able to start to estimate the cost because they can say, right, if we'd had this mechanism in place last year or the year before or the year before that, um, how much would it have cost us? And then doing that process over a long period of time gives you a, a sense of the average cost and, and the cost in every one, every 10 years or 20 years um, to formulate our kind of understanding of the types of funding we need. So, um, so they did that modelling uh, with support from the World Bank and, and, and support from, from other partners as well. Um, and they decided to put two um, financing um, instruments in place. So the first is a contingency fund. And the contingency fund kind of has two roles. First one is it's going to help for years where there's small amounts of scale up. So, for example, one or maybe two districts um, uh, trigger. And then the contingency fund is your first port of call to be able to, to respond to that. And the contingency fund has been used uh, this year and, and, and last year as well. Um, but, but the other flexibility is that if something else were to happen outside of this mechanism, government can also call on that contingency fund because it's got some additional funding there for, for broader things. So if, for example, uh, like we saw with the tropical cyclone this year in south of Malawi, which is not covered in, in this mechanism, they can also use the contingency fund for that. So there's some flexibility. 
Um, but what the government also wanted to test was actually kind of underwriting the risk of of, of all of these countries, oh, sorry, all of these districts triggering and having a, a huge, you know, 10 million, uh, say, kind of need to respond, but not being sure if the budget was available. So they've also now procured a, um, an insurance product for the next two years to, to, uh, to see how that works. And that was with funding support from, from the Global Shield uh, financing facility, formerly known as, as, the, as the GRIF. Um, so they've put this insurance policy in place and really that's there to, to make sure they can meet the needs of, of years when four or five, six districts trigger. So having these two complementary instruments um, and using that insurance policy in the best place uh, not for the small scale ups, but for the ones where you get multiple districts. Give you a little bit of an insight into experience to date. So in 21-22, three districts scaled up. So um, in Cheo, Blantyre and Tiolo. Um, in Cheo triggered based on the objective triggers. The rainfall said that it was it was below the threshold and it triggered. But Blantyre and Tiolo didn't. But actually the um, the index values were very, very close to the threshold. So government decided to do this evidence review and see, well, should they have triggered? Um, was there enough need on the ground to justify triggering? You know, what do we know about these uh, these districts and how does that inform our thinking? And by going through that process, they actually decided, yes, uh, we should trigger. Um, so in all three districts, they triggered around 6.3 million was, was spent um, to, to, to cover around 400,000 people. Um, what we did, however, face is some delays in, in, in the getting the funding out. So in particular, in some of the districts, the social registry wasn't as up to date as it should have been. So it took some time to update it and make sure the money was going to the right people. Ideally, that would have been done in advance. Um, and also some of the payments contracts with the financial institutions uh, were quite complicated. There were some procurement issues which held up that. And again, um, in I think one of the districts, uh, they had to focus on manual payments after trying to sort this out but lots of lessons there for, for future seasons um, this year uh, in most of the districts the the, the rains have been good um, but actually again by going through the evidence review process the government decided to scale up in, in Karunga which is a district in the north of Malawi now despite it being fairly um, above the rainfall triggers in terms of um, it wasn't you know very very close that there was a bit of room um, what the government found on inspection was that uh, the distribution of the rainfall data was very, very unusual. And so you had this period of drought followed by a period of flood. Um, and so actually the decision was that there was need and we could take funding from the contingency fund um, to, to, to make those transfers. And this is really valuable in having these two instruments because if we only had the insurance instrument that's purely based on the, the kind of parametric trigger values, we wouldn't have had the funding available to scale up. But by having this flexible contingency fund, uh, we were able to, and hopefully we can refine it as we go forward. Um, I will jump to my last slide because I think I'm just at 20 minutes. A um, couple of lessons. Uh, strong government ownership is needed. So government having a task force, absolutely valuable. Um, and I think the only uh, kind of other lesson here that I haven't really talked about is is that investment in the delivery system. So I just talked a bit about it then, but making sure that you you actually are able to, um, to get the money where you need it to be. And that's where the, the funding that was received from the Global Shield Financing Facility, investments in technical assistance, capacity building, and, and opportunities to work with the, um, the providers of these services were really, really valuable to the team. And I will just put up, I've got one more slide, but um, we can, uh, I'll share these slides. And then finally, if you um, if you need any more information, there is a policy note, there is a technical note, there's a video. We've got a lot of information out there, so so you shouldn't be um, short of finding out more. Over to you, Anna. Thanks so much. Fantastic. Thank you, Evie. It's amazing. It's really incredible the amount of information and report um, that you've generated already on the experiences in Malawi. It's definitely one of the most explored country phase that I ever heard when discussing DRF. So thank you for the presentation also for the work that we've been doing as part of the World Bank in the country. Um, so as we don't have much time, uh, but still have some very interesting questions that I'm keeping at the end to the end, uh, just uh, lead up to Jennifer for our discussion on the global shoot. And uh, yeah, over to you, Jennifer. Thank you. Great. 
Thank you so much, Anna, for that introduction. I'm very happy to be here today. My name is Jennifer Phillips. I work as part of the Inter Resilience uh, Global Partnership, which is becoming the Global Shield uh, against climate risk. And for this reason, you'll be hearing that term a lot more. And so basically, for those who are not familiar, the Global Shield was launched last year during COP in Egypt, um, basically with the these three different purposes. So as we already heard in these different case studies, right, a lot of governments and individuals do not have access to these prearranged financial instruments, which are very crucial to being able to respond to different climate risk. And so there's growing recognition that countries and individuals have to move in this direction of thinking about which types of instruments could be used to manage their risk. And uh, how could they best be supported then to develop and implement these different types of instruments. And so this is the overall goal of the Global Shield. It's first bringing together all of these stakeholders for global cooperation to evaluate what the risks are within the countries and determine uh, which instruments would be most appropriate for dealing with these. This is done through cooperation with different implementing agencies like WFP and UNCDF, as well as engagements with the private sector and with the governments themselves in the lead for this process. It's also very much focused on helping governments to prioritize their needs when it comes to thinking about what type of instruments they want to invest in. And it's also focused on bringing in this technical and financial support so that countries can develop and use these instruments in a very short time span. Because we know that climate change is having a substantial effect on climate risk and there's not enough time to um, wait for developing and implementing these different types of instruments. What we work to do is to partner together with different countries to evaluate the risk that they're facing and determine which type of instruments would be most appropriate to dealing with these different types of risk. And so with that, on the screen here, you see the Global Shield Pathfinder countries that were announced last year during COP. And so these are the countries, eight countries and one region, the Pacific region also included here, that we will be focused on in 2023. However, it's important to note that at the end of this year and in early 2024, we're going to be opening up calls for application for more countries to apply to become part of the Global Shield. And so if you go to our website, globalshield.org, you will see that we have a country prioritization framework, which provides the criteria on how future countries will be selected, looking at um, different factors like how they are affected by climate risk, as well as their readiness to work on these different types of uh, topics. And so I very much encourage anyone who's working in a country who's not one of these to go on the website and to check out the country prioritization framework to see how your country um, might be able to qualify for becoming one of the future Global Shield countries. And so just as a bit of background, this initiative is a V20 G7 led initiative. We work very closely with the Vulnerable 20, which is a group of finance ministries from the Climate Vulnerable Forum. This encompasses 58 countries total, and they've played a strong role in developing the Global Shield together with G20 um, and G7 countries, as we see listed here. And so this initiative builds upon the commitments that were also previously made for the Inter-Resilience Global Partnership. And so, for example, with the World Bank, they had their GRIF, the Global Risk Financing Facility, which is becoming the Global Shield uh, Financing Facility. And so some of this funding that was already allocated will then be um, added to and provided then through the mechanism of the Global Shield. And so right now we have the total commitment of 265 million, but we're very much looking forward to expanding this number in the coming years. And through the wide range of support that we've seen so far, we very much look forward to building up this number as the recognition continues to grow about this need of investing in financial instruments to better 
manage climate risk. And so when thinking about the different types of financial instruments that could be developed under the Global Shield, what was really nice in today's session is that we heard three different excellent country examples um, where, for example, insurance was used um, as a mechanism to strengthen a social protection system in Fiji, or in the case of um, Nicaragua, thinking about how WFP could also work with governments to benefit from these different types of instruments. And in the case of Malawi, thinking about several different types of instruments that could be used to manage these risks. And so each of these different examples would be also example of instruments that could be developed under the Global Shield. And so as we see on this um, presentation slide here, the focus is both thinking about the household level and how to strengthen livelihood protection and social protection systems. As we know, direct support for individuals is very crucial after these different climate risks, um, natural hazards affect populations, as well as thinking at, uh, about what can be done on the national and subnational level. And so this includes all of the different types of products like insurance via the regional risk pools like CRIF, uh, SBC, and the African Risk Capacity. It also includes contingent credit, uh, contingent funds, grant mechanisms, all of these different types of instruments that can be used, catastrophe bonds, to support countries, organizations, businesses, and individuals after these events. And as part of the Global Shield, we also recognize that these money in products is only one component to have an effective financing strategy. The other important um, component is thinking about the money out strategy. So how do you actually then get this financing to where it needs to go after disasters? And in this regard, we would also be able to work on developing these shock responsive social protection systems, working uh, together with different organizations on early and anticipatory action protocols and developing contingency plans. And so as part of the work of the Global Shield, in addition to developing these financial instruments, the other type of activities that can be funded would be, for example, supporting the development of policy reforms um, that's needed to integrate disaster risk financing into disaster risk management strategies, as well as looking at strengthening regulatory frameworks, which are often needed to be able to offer these products um, in the market through private sector companies. We would also be open to fostering in different investments, um, the capitalization of risk carriers, which we know is very important to making these products more affordable, um, looking at premium financing, um, in alignment with our capital and premium support principles, looking at leveraging the risk industry and um, working on risk analytics, which are very important to determining um, which type of instruments would be most appropriate and also very critical for the development of parametric and index-based products, if these are the products that governments are interested in investing in as well as building up the early warning system. So as part of the Global Shield, we don't want to only focus on the financial instruments. We also want to think about all of these other factors that play a key role in making these instruments effective and affordable. And so really quick, I'll just provide a quick overview here of how this Global Shield process works, the in-country process. It's foreseen to be about a six to 12 month process that we go through together with the governments. We partner together with the ministries of finance as well as the any of the other ministries that are interested in taking a leading role in this process. And they are very much in the driver's seat for pushing this process forward. And basically what we do then is to initiate the in-country processes, we'll have a kickoff workshop where we bring together all of these stakeholders from the different government ministries, from the private sector, from civil society organizations, and from academic think tanks and different implementing agencies to better understand what are the biggest climate risks that are affecting the country and where additional support is needed. 
We also work together with the Global Risk Modeling Alliance that's hosted by the Frankfurt School, which focuses on bringing the public sector, private sector, and academic sector together to create a common understanding on the hazards that exist in the country and build capacities to work on risk analytics and risk modeling within the country. After this initial kickoff workshops, what we then work to do is conduct a type of stock take. And basically here, what we're looking to see is what is already existing and what's already being developed in the country. It's not our intention to duplicate anything that's already ongoing, but rather to enhance and increase ongoing efforts and identify where additional support is needed. Once we conduct the stock take, and work together with the Global Risk Modeling Alliance uh, to understand the hazards affecting the country, we will then conduct a type of gap analysis so that we can see where support is missing and where the country should prioritize their efforts to um, be the most effective in using these different types of instruments. And so once we go through this process, the government will then be charged with developing their requests for climate and disaster risk financing and insurance support, CDRFI for short. And so as part of this request, it can include many different components. It could include, for example, a request for premium financing to support purchasing um, insurance policy from the African risk capacity, for example. It can include a request um, very general on one in technical advisory services to evaluate um, how to best manage flooding within the country and determining which instrument would best be used there. It can include requests for developing um, the private sector market for developing different insurance or credit instruments that could be used. And so as part of their request, it can include many different components. And then basically this request would then go to our global shield finance and structure, which comprises three different financing vehicles, including the global shield financing facility that's hosted by the World Bank, the global shield solutions platform that's hosted by Frankfurt School, and the global shield um, V20 joint uh, multi-donor fund, which is hosted by the V20. And so depending on the type of request that is and the type of instrument they're looking for support for, for example, for a sovereign level instrument, uh, this could be a natural fit for the Global Shield Financing Facility for the World Bank to fulfill. If they're looking for private sector development, the Global Shield Solutions Platform might be a natural fit to take on this. And based on the type of request, the finance and structure would work together then to develop this tailored support package and would then partner uh, together with different institutions and organizations to work on implementing the support package. And so just to finish up very quickly here, we see an outline of the different financial vehicles that will be used as part of the Global Shield. And basically with each of these different financial vehicles, there's different areas that they're specializing in. One thing that's very exciting about the Global Shield Financing Facility, that's a bit of a difference from the GRIF, is that with the Global Shield Financing Facility, they will be able to also provide funding to um, different organizations like the World Food Program to uh, work on developing the products on their side, um, which previously with the GRIF, uh, their funding was primarily for World Bank projects. So this is an exciting development to see how they're um, working more and more with other partners and organizations to increase these instruments. But the Global Shield Solutions Platform, this is also in addition to the Injury Resilient Solutions Fund, which will also still be running um, and continue to be operated over the next coming years. And so if there's any countries that are not yet a Pathfinder country or a Global Shield country, they can still always consider um, partnering together with the Injury Resilient Solutions Fund as well. And then with the V20 joint 
multi-donor fund, they will be focusing a lot on helping countries to develop their climate prosperity plans and helping countries to think about how to integrate um, this disaster risk financing into their long-term development strategies. And so with that, I'll stop there and happy to answer any questions. Thank you a lot, Jennifer, for this, yeah, also short, but very, very explanatory <laughs> presentation on the Global Shield. Uh, some specific questions on the Global Shield on the chat, so I would encourage you to take a look at that. We don't have much more than five minutes before the end of this session. So uh, just to make sure that uh, I see most of the questions has been answered already by the panelists, but uh, we had one common question that I wanted to now take the opportunity to ask to each of the panelists uh, and ask them to lim try to limit yourself to one minute maximum because we don't really have much time before the, um, the end. But uh, one key um, uh, discussion that you're having here in the Q&A is on the importance of the assessments, uh, monitoring, evaluation of all these processes, right? So I believe this can also even help countries to create and leverage evidence uh, to apply for financing opportunities such as those that are now being offered by the Global Shield. So I, I wanted to have like one minute thoughts about that importance and if you know and if you would like to raise anything that is going on in the country that you are having experiencing. Uh, so starting with uh, Eliseo. Hi Anna, thank you. Uh, I think from my side, uh, I think it's really important to have uh, or prepared contingency plans uh, so you will be able to also deliver the, a response in, in a more integrated and efficient way. Thank All you. Right. Amit, any considerations on, on the question? Uh, yes, and I think that was also asked and I tried to answer it a bit. So I can say this for Pacific and especially in Fiji case, the program is new, just one year old. Um, but uh, in any case, like our broader program itself is only just two and a half year old. And uh, well, in a way, good for the program. No, not really, really good. Good is not the right word. So in the first quarter, there were some payouts and we are... We are commissioning some some assessment. There are some ad hoc assessments, not love more assessment, like you know, people who receive the payouts. That we we try to talk to them, capture their stories. So some have been documented and shared through video messages by them. So they are on the YouTube channel. I put the link. But a, a more formal assessment is 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 being planned, and we will be then sharing it with the you know wider global audience. I think your point is quite right especially the MNE part for social protection program is it's it's not as straightforward because uh, it, it involves various ministries, various departments. You have payout ministry, you have department dealing with social welfare, you have um, various uh, regulations around information sharing. So MNE is a bit of a challenge for such programs for development actors, but nevertheless, uh, it is very important. And we will, from the impact side, as I said, we will be looking to share information. Excellent, Amy. Thank you a lot for the reflection and for sharing the, what's coming up for PG. We're looking forward to the evidence that's coming. Evie, any considerations? And uh, yeah, from the thousand reports you already shared on Malawi, I believe that is something that comes <laughs> as interesting for <laughs> Yeah, we did a, a, a COVID urban cash transfer intervention. So taking the social cash transfer and actually expanding it to urban areas for that period of COVID. And we did a process evaluation on that. And a lot of the learnings from that um, actually has fed into to the design of, of, of the work that we're doing now uh, in rural areas. So just just to there's, there's a report out there which um, is available to everyone to read. And then we will 
continue to integrate more of those kind of evaluations and and I'm working on a, a number of other kind of um, impact evaluations on other projects as well so hugely important um, but we want to see what we can learn from about having the insurance product in place does it significantly um, kind of benefit and what's the the value for money assessment of that so the next two years there will be a lot of uh, learning to take from and happy to come back in in two years and talk about it then thanks so much yeah, definitely. That's what I was saying. Like, basically, we look forward to having another webinar here uh, with all the findings and uh, lessons learned again, and not just from the implementation, but also based on and on the impact assessments that are being now conducted. Thank you, Evie. And Jennifer, over to you before we close. Any reflections on that, on the implications for the global shift? <laughs> Yeah, the, the question of thinking about the effectiveness of these different types of instruments and the role of ONI and reports. I mean, this is a has been a big priority for the Insure Resilience Global Partnership as well. And we also have an impact working group that um, very much wants to bring together the different stakeholders that work in this area to uh, create a common understanding of how these instruments can most effectively be used as well as identify areas where research knowledge um, is missing in, in terms of evaluating the effectiveness of this. So I'd be happy to include a link on this in the chat and very much encourage those interested in finding out more about the impact and evidence around these different approaches to uh, reach out and to join the working group. Thank you a lot, Jennifer. Yeah, every type of resources that were shared here, I believe it will also be shared on the website, on the web page from subtraction.org uh, from the webinar. So I encourage you all to look it up uh, and also see the recordings and to check there for the slides. Thank you again a lot for all the panelists who took your time and your availability to be here with us. I know it's a busy time of the year among summer holidays in some parts of the world and uh, even a national holiday in Malawi so thank you a lot we had more than 70 almost 80 participants along the whole session so it was a very good uh yeah involvement and engagement and thank you all for the also the, the, the attendants who were here up to the end with us and uh, yeah looking forward to the next discussion that we have on the topic thank you bye-bye <laughs>